Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for a uh, great morning and your participation in the morning. Uh, we're really excited to have a lunch. We're going to have a wonderful conversation with one of the leading entre entrepreneurs in the United States, and certainly in Southern California, Brian Lee. And uh, he, Jennifer Manukin has agreed to help facilitate that conversation. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Dean Manukin and Brian Lee. Thank you. So welcome everybody. Uh, I hear it's been an interesting morning. This is, can, if we can turn this down a little bit, that would be, that would be great. <laughs> all right, can everybody hear me now? Excellent. Um, so thank you all for coming to this, this event. Uh, and I'm Jennifer Manukin, and I have the good luck of being dean here at UCLA. And today I have the additional good luck of getting to have a conversation uh, with Brian Lee. Uh, Brian Lee is one of our most interesting and successful graduates here at UCLA Law. He's a leading tech entrepreneur whose qualities of innovation and determination and creativity have led to some really interesting new companies in the world. Um, so Brian, first of all, just thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, Brian's really a trailblazer in the new economy, and he, he co-founded, for example, LegalZoom, uh, as well as Shoe Dazzle as well as The Honest Company, uh, Jessica Alba's uh, uh, the, the immensely popular socially conscious baby and home care company. Um, and so in all of these adventures, I think it's fair to say that he's really applied a keen sense of what's important to consumers, honed often through strong media ca social media campaigns, um, and built business models that are built for profitability and success, but also a certain amount of disruption or rethinking of what was there before. Uh, and certainly thanks to Brian, there are hundreds of people in Southern California and elsewhere that have jobs they didn't have before your creativity went to work. Um, after recently ending his run as CEO of the Honest Company, uh, he's turned to his newest enterprise, BAM Ventures, um, which is an entrepreneurial investment platform that I'm going to ask him about. Um, before all of this, he did work as a tax lawyer at Skadden and as a manager at Deloitte. And he's also a double Bruin, I hope a proud double Bruin. Very yes, proud. excellent. Uh, he got his BA magna cum laude in economics and business here from UCLA in 1993. And then he graduated from the law school in 96. Uh, and he's also been a dedicated alum and is on the board of the Lowell Milken Institute um, and is a member of my centennial campaign cabinet. Um, and I mean, we're just really proud of everything you've done and thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you. It's such a nice intro. Uh, <laughs> you deserve that and more. Um, I'd love to start by asking you to tell us a little bit about your latest company, um, BAM Ventures. Mm -hmm. I know you're not an incubator, and I know you're not an accelerator, and I think you're not exactly just an angel investor. So, so what are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so BAM Ventures, there's, I guess, two parts to it. There's the BAM Venture side and what I call the BAM Labs side. Um, the BAM venture side is, is it's a venture fund that I started, um, and we invest in pre-seed and seed stage deals, uh, mostly tech-focused, consumer-focused companies in the Los Angeles area. I'd say about 60 to 65% of our investments are in LA, um, and then the rest in like Austin, Chicago, New York, San Francisco. Um, and then the BAM lab side, uh, it's, it's really a production studio where I'll be producing business concepts out of this lab. So it's not a traditional incubator or accelerator. Okay, when you talk about a production lab, I think of the entertainment industry, I think of films and producers. Mm -hmm. Tell me about what it means to be a production lab in this context. Sure, so I, I really took the idea from, mm -hmm. from, from the entertainment uh, industry. When you, when you think about you know, what a producer does, like when you watch the Academy Awards, you know, the, the biggest award of the night is film of the year, picture of the year, and the person who goes up there is the producer, and he or she, you know, gets the award, and they're like, um, you know, thank you to the writers, thank you to the directors, thank you to the actors, and then you sit there, and you, like, you realize something that the, the guy holding, or the woman holding the statue also made all the money, right? And so, I'm like, I, I, I can do that, I can produce <laughs> something, um, but instead of producing movies, I'm producing businesses, and so, traditionally, what a producer does is, you either write your own screenplay or acquire a script. Um, you hire the director, you get talent attached to it, the actors, the actresses. Um, you provide financing or raise the financing for a movie, and then you help with distribution of the movie, getting it 
marketed and distributed. And so I'm doing the same kind of quadrant of work, but instead of producing movies, we're producing companies. And so unlike and some accelerators or incubators, whether it be shared platforms or shared resources, right. here you're kind of producing them one at a time or yeah, less? Yeah, or... they're all one-off companies. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, I don't think if you're making the next Star Wars movie, you would have the same crew working, you know, another drama, mm -hmm. right? So they're, they're very individualized kind of projects that, that we'll be launching. And, and the thing is, I, I mean, I, I kind of looked at a lot of these accelerators and incubators, um, and a lot of them are great, honestly. We've got some great ones in LA even. But I, I'm, not a, I'm not really a believer in, in kind of shared platforms. You know, you've got a marketing team helping you know, 20 companies in a class, and you've got you know, a shared finance team, or, or, and then you bring in mentors to help them. I'm not really doing any of that, because I, I kind of feel like you know, the team that I want to build for each project should be 100% dedicated to just that project um, and taking it to to, to market. Mm -hmm. so, so, so you've got a couple of ventures going there, and then there's others in which you're, you're investing right. and, and advising. Right. Um, what do you look for in a new venture? You know, we, we invest super early. So we invest in entrepreneurs with, with an idea. Um, usually there's no numbers to diligence, mm -hmm. right? We don't have any financials to go off of. It, it's really, we're investing behind an entrepreneur. And so for us, it's a very simple thesis at BAM Ventures. We invest in great entrepreneurs. We have to love the entrepreneur, not hate the idea. And so that's kind of like the rule we, we do for all our investments because, I mean, you know, you've all heard it before, a great entrepreneur you know, will, will make even a bad idea work, right? And so that's who we invest behind. We, we spend a lot of time understanding you know, the personality do you want them to have a track record, or can you get seduced by the power of their passion for what they're doing? Absolutely, it's more about the passion. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not one for experience. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they could have failed five times, truthfully, in previous ventures, and if we, if we believe in them, we'll, we'll still back them. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't, have to have, they don't have to be coming from you know, Snap or Amazon or something else for us to, to invest in them either. It, it's really on an individual case-by-case -case basis. It's interesting. I mean, so that sounds, I mean, that, that, that sounds like you're willing to take on quite a bit of risk um, if you believe in it. Yes, absolutely. And I guess that leads me to want to talk to you more generally about mm -hmm. risk and how you think about risk. I mean, lawyers overall tend to be a relatively risk-averse bunch, <laughs> um, not necessarily risk-embracing um, uh, and often have a very different mindset than entrepreneurs um, in that regard. Um, you're also a lawyer trained right here in this building, um, mm -hmm. but you obviously don't fit that mold. Um, and I'd love to I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, um, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are born with an entrepreneurial like DNA. I, I, I really do believe that. I think if you're just a risk averse person, I. You're just a risk-averse person, really. It, it, I don't think it, I don't think you can take someone who's like completely risk-averse and convert them into being an entrepreneur. I think it, it's. I don't know. I, I meet so many people who will come to me, and 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 tell me, you know, I'm I'm, I have this idea. I want to go start it, but I'm just kind of I, I want to get more experience. I'm, I'm working at Google right now, and I want to get more experience, or, you know, I want to save up more money and then and then go start something. You know, it, it's like, it's kind of the wrong mindset if you want to be an entrepreneur. It, it, it's, you know, if you have an idea, go do it today, right? You're probably already, you know, you probably should have done it yesterday. You know, it's like, just go and do it. You know, don't, don't give yourself reasons not to do something. Um, and I think that's like, those are the people we want to invest in, right? People that, 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 aren't, that aren't, you know, worried about, tomorrow, <laughs> they're, 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 they, they go do it today, right? So I, I, I get that, but I guess I wanna, I wanna push a little bit harder on, I mean, obviously there are probably temperamental differences in some folks who are just risk-loving and others who, who 
who operate differently. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we're both parents, right? And yeah. we've probably, you've probably heard, like one of the buzzwords in parenting is about growth mindset, right? And the idea that there aren't fixed mindsets, but that actually it's possible for people to experience transformative change uh, through seeing what's seeing the benefits of it. Um, so are you really telling me that, I mean, the, I don't know if we, we don't look like we have too many students in the room, but that if we did, that if they're here in law school, they've already made this one relatively risk averse decision and it's too late? Or, <laughs> or is there the possibility of um, helping, helping students and others understand the benefits of maybe being somewhat less afraid of risk? Yeah, I, I, I look. I still believe that if you're extremely passionate about something, if you believe in yourself to make something happen, then then you should do it. Mm -hmm. And I like thank gosh there's not a lot of students in here, but I would tell them, you're wasting your time in school. <laughs> right? It's like you should go you should go do that today. because um, it's one of the regrets that I've had. I, I I've never talked to you about this, Dean, but <laughs> 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 Not that I regret going to law school. I love my experience in law school. <laughs> okay, um, there we go. Yeah, you heard it's, it here. It's, it's the first time I saw, you know, the internet. Right. You know, I, I was at Powell Library, and it was a first. This is way long ago. This is back in ninety. Gosh, what year would that have been? Ninety six, like ninety five. Right. Right. I, I was at Powell Library, and I saw the internet for my first time, and I was like, oh my god, this is, this is going to change everything. Mm -hmm. Right. It's going to change the world. And I remember I had this conversation with my mom and dad. I was like, you know, I, I just saw this thing. It's called the World Wide Web. I, I think it's my, it's like I, I could really think of stuff to do on it and this and that. And my mom and dad like, no, you're finishing school. Mm -hmm. Honestly, they're like, you're going to finish school. And, and being the good Korean son, I was like, yes, yes, sir. <laughs> right? and, and I look back on that, and I'm like, I, I, I kind of started late. I really did. And, it's like, and then it's like I didn't know what to do. Started go, I applied to law school and fortunately got in. And, and, <laughs> and I just thought it would give me three more years to decide what to do. And, and then it's like, you know, you just, I, I, I was one that I never thought that I would be a lawyer. I really didn't. I, I didn't even go to law school thinking I would be a lawyer. I went to law school thinking it'll give me more time to decide what to do. Um, and so for me, it's like, and then, but what happens is, it, you know, you hit that you know, second year mark and everyone starts getting jobs around you and all your friends are like, where are you working this summer? I'm like, nowhere. Um, but then you, you start to think, okay, well, you know, I went to law school. I might as well, like, you know, go try work for a out, firm. Right. Try it out. And so I ended up doing that. Um, and it was my time at, at the law firm where I was like, okay, this is definitely not my calling. Right. Um, and that's when we started LegalZoom, right? And so, you know. But you I probably couldn't have started LegalZoom without law school, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And, and that's why I'm like, you know, I think it was a good thing I went to law school. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, but even if it wasn't LegalZoom, even if it was, I was a you know, junior in college, I just didn't know what to start on, on, on online, right? right. But, but, you know, if you are in that position where you know what you want to do, Right, and, and you're passionate about it, I, I, I would encourage you to go do it. Right. No, that's right. I mean, I, I don't think we, I don't want to sell a degree as a holding position either, right? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, although I want to come back to whether, whether law school and the analytics and the problem solving that you learn here mm -hmm. um, has any benefits. I mean, maybe yeah. the answer is no, and you should have left after your junior year of college, <laughs> but then you wouldn't be a double Bruin. So, <laughs> um, uh, but I guess I, I want to ask you, your three, three of your ventures uh, are in really different spaces, right? Mm -hmm. So LegalZoom did something pretty um, extraordinary, um, and it, it, it created a new way of thinking about legal services for folks who might not be able to afford traditional lawyers. And it was, um, it was certainly disruptive, and there were, there were fights about whether it was the practice of law, right? And mm -hmm. um, Shoe Dazzle created an online showroom with quite fancy shoes at better prices. And yeah. uh, the Honest Company focused on consumers who cared a lot about um, the, the 
the products and that they were using in especially around their children and their home. Is there something that links them, or how do, how how can we do they link together in some in some way that isn't obvious? Or help me understand how they connect. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they're pretty diverse, I, I guess, industries within within consumer. Um, you know, they 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 all kind of if you look back at them, they kind of relate to the stage of life I was at. Ah. Right? It, it, it's, when I started LegalZoom, I, I was a lawyer. Um, when I started Shoe Dazzle, it was with my wife and with Kim Kardashian, and it was when I first got married, and I started seeing how my wife was buying shoes. <laughs> and she, she bought a lot of them. Um, and I was like, gosh, you know. There's a market here. Yeah, there's a market here. Yeah. <laughs> I know there are women that will buy a pair of affordable shoes, a pair of affordable shoes every month, and that was the genesis of Shoe Dazzle. And then the Honest Company uh, was started uh, when we had our child. Um, and I just kind of saw how my wife's behavior changed after having Davis. Um, you know, she started shopping Whole Foods all of a sudden. She started making organic purees for the baby. And I was like, gosh, that really changed, right? Um, and so I, I guess that's kind of like the cadence, but, but really, I, I, I just think of business as business. Mm -hmm. You know, that, it, it, it's, the, the fundamentals of business are all the same. It really doesn't matter what industry, and there's so many similarities and, and, and functions across all business that, that, that all businesses follow. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, it's like, I always kind of say it, it's, it's, it's really hard to start anything, mm -hmm. but it, it's, it's, it's almost just as hard to start you know, a, a, a pizza restaurant as it is Facebook. It, it, it really, it's like the, the startup stage is about the same. It's like, you're, it's like if you're, if you're going to be a successful restaurateur running a pizza shop, it's a lot of work. Right. You know, you got to get the you got to get the inventory correct. You got to market. You got to make sure you're located. It's like there's a lot of work involved. And so what I always tell anyone is, if you're going to go start something, and if you're going to be passionate about something, think big. Right. Right. Like like think of the possibilities. Don't don't just think I'm starting a pizza shop and it's going to make me you know a good living. Think how are you going to turn that into the next Domino's, okay. right? And 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 or start something that can scale like a, like a platform or, 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 or a Facebook or Snap, mm -hmm. right? Like you want to think about scale because it's, it's really hard to start anything. I get the feeling though that that startup phase is what you're most excited and passionate about. Yeah. It's precisely that challenge that gets you most excited. Is that fair? Oh yeah. yeah. I, I, I love the startup. I, I love the, the, the chaos of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it is chaotic. Um, but I love, I love Starting something from nothing, mm -hmm. and and realizing that you know years later that you've created something that that, that exists um, that wasn't there before, mm -hmm. and that's that's the that's the stage that I love. I love like that initial coming up with an idea, building teams, getting it traction, getting it to market. Um, I don't like actually operating companies. Mm -hmm. um, I get really I, I get kind of frustrated mm -hmm. uh, when companies get to scale. Which is why at LegalZoom, I, I was running LegalZoom with Brian Liu, another UCLA. Another UCLA law yep. grad, yeah. So we started it together. And we ran that for about seven or eight years. And we hired a CEO um, to take it to the next level. Shoe Dazzle, I ran for four years. And we brought in the CEO. And then The Honest Company, I ran for five years. And we just brought in an outside CEO. So it's kind of, um, if you see a pattern, right? It's because at, at some point, I'll, I'll like be at work. and Half my day is spent with lawyers, like you all. Um, and then the other half is dealt with finance, accounting, investors. I just want to build. You know, I, I, just want to, I just want to build. And, and so for me, it's, I, I don't like that part of running a business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, just, that's just me. Some people love it, and, and more power to them. And hence, BAM Ventures lets you focus on the building phase. Yeah, right? and that's why, that's why it's like, I'm having the time of my life because now I, I just get to produce companies and invest in great entrepreneurs. It's a lot of fun. Now you mentioned to me that a lot of, that that LA and the LA area is where the where it's the predominant place for your yeah. investments. Not the only one, but one of the central ones. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. I mean, you're obviously committed to 
the LA area entrepreneurship um, and this environment. What do you think, what, what's in store? What do you think the forecast is for entrepreneurship tech here, no, here in LA over the next few years? I, I think it's an ex extremely exciting time to be an entrepreneur in Los Angeles. Um, it, the ecosystem has grown tremendously in the last even you know, five years. Because um, in tech, well, you know, every year is like dog years, right? So it's like in the last. I say five that about years Dean years too. I say exactly <laughs> the same thing. Because um, <laughs> yeah, I, I remember when we started LegalZoom, like this was like close to 20 years ago. There was like one software engineer in the entire city, and every company was fighting for that same software engineer. And so when you look at LA as an ecosystem, I, I mean, we're never. Well, I should never say never, but I don't think we'll ever be, you know, Silicon Valley and San Francisco. And that's really because of time. It, it, we, we do not have great grandparents named Fairchild Semiconductor, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and Intel and, and so forth. And we don't have grandparents named Yahoo and eBay and, and Google and Apple. We just don't have that, right? Um, we have grandparents named Sony, you know, and, and, and Columbia Pictures. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, it, it's, it, it took a while for the ecosystem to even really get started here. Because initially, during the early stages of, of internet and technology uh, in LA, we had to self-fund, right? So if you look at like the early successes of these companies in Los Angeles, they were all about monetization, which is why LegalZoom worked. Because LegalZoom was profitable from day one, right? We bootstrapped LegalZoom all the way to, to where it is today. Um, we, we did take an outside capital, but it was never for the company. Right? It was always for existing shareholders. We never, it was all secondary shares. It was never primary. Um, and if you look at like, you know, um, GoTo, which became Overture, which started paid search, it was all about monetizing, monetizing search, mm -hmm. right? Now, and now that's, you know, Google's engine, right? Mm -hmm. But, and then you look at like the other successes like Shopzilla and um, Price Grabber, it was all lead generation because of monetized, Cars Direct, it was all about monetization because there was no money in Los Angeles, right? There was no money in Los Angeles, so, so we had to bootstrap. But then once we started having a few kind of earlier successes, like, um, like Cornerstone On Demand went out, they went public, and you had a couple others. Finally, it's like we started getting a little bit more venture capital attracted to the city. But it took a while for like the ecosystem to be even strong enough to support a Snapchat, a Snap, right? Because you know, never in my wildest dreams, when, like you know, 15 years ago, would I would I hear from anyone just grow, mm -hmm. right? Just grow the platform, attract 100 million users, and we'll figure out how to monetize, mm -hmm. right? But the Bay Area always had that, which right. is why you can start Facebook and Instagram and you know, platforms, social platforms up there, right? Because they didn't have to worry worry about monetizing because they had enough venture capital to keep supporting them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. What about the climate here in LA? Um, Mayor Garcetti has emphasized entrepreneurship as part of his agenda and focus, um, but the, the Kauffman Foundation in its recent State of Entrepreneurship uh, report uh, said, and I'm quoting here, most entrepreneurs don't feel supported by the government and feel that the government favors large corporations over smaller businesses like theirs. Is that fair? Is that true? Are there things that local and state government could be doing to support um, entrepreneurship. Yeah. What are your I, thoughts? Well, I, I never felt under-supported, but I never felt over-supported either. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's really, when you look at, you know, just the economy in the U.S. in, in general, it's, all, it's, it's mostly small business. I mean, right. we, all, we all know that. And I, I do feel that these larger corporations with all the lobby dollars that they have and a lot of you know, the ears of, of these politicians uh, do get their you know, unfair kind of share of the pie. Um, I think it was crazy, like some of the, the tax laws that they're trying to implement in terms of stock options. I mean, that would have killed technology altogether. <laughs> and luckily, that didn't make it through. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I was actually scared. Right. right? Like, if they, if they started taxing options on, on my employees, right. it's uh, it would be over, right? It, so. Um, I think, I think there are certain cities that are doing better jobs than others. Um, I think Austin, Texas does a wonderful job attracting tech talent and growing that community. 
and, and providing incentives for entrepreneurs to move there. Um, and certain tax, uh, tax credits go a long way, right? right? And, and, and stipends go a long way, like government stipends. And so you know, certain cities are, I think, doing better jobs than, than others. And how would you rate LA's job? I think, I think, I think Mayor Garcetti is doing a great job with supporting you know, the entrepreneurs. Um, I still don't see like a tech center. Everyone calls it Silicon Beach, mm -hmm. but that's but there's no incentive to be there, right? There's still a lot of space in Santa Monica. I think that could be subsidized for entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. and I, I've spoken to the mayor about this, and <laughs> and you know hopefully we'll get there honestly because he is a supporter. Um, I, I I personally like him a lot. Mm -hmm. You've known him a long time, right? Yeah. I, I've From your legal Zoom day, yeah. days? And yeah, he was our congressman, our, 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 con, not con, yeah, our, con, our assemblyman mm -hmm. uh, for Hollywood when mm -hmm. we were out in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think I, we saw him together at a dinner um, yeah. at UCLA yeah. a couple of years ago. Um, so we saw a large IPO with Snap, mm -hmm. um, but there have been lots of merger exits. Uh, at the end of February, I think Amazon purchased Ring, uh, which was a Santa mm -hmm. Monica startup. Uh, Unilever bought Dollar Shave Club. Um, do you think that, what direction do you think we're going to see there, or will we see a blend? Um, I think, IPOs, I, mergers, both? What do you think? I think we're going to see a blend. Mm -hmm. um, I think certain companies have the right to be public, and certain companies don't. Mm -hmm. And certain companies, the better result is a merger and acquisition, mm -hmm. right, or not being acquired. Um, look, it's very, we all know how expensive it is to, to run a public company and, and expensive in a lot of ways, right? right? It, it, it really depends on the type of business you're running, you know, how much runway you have for growth. You know, are you being, you know, uh, marketed as a growth business or an EBITDA business and, and how predictable is that going forward, right? Which is why Snap's having such a hard time because it's pretty unpredictable, right? I mean, they're doing great. I, I, I'm long a snap. Mm -hmm. um, I would never bet against Evan, truthfully. I think he's a wonderful, uh, just gifted product person. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's tough. It, it's, it's how much do you believe in, in, in your forecasts as well? And but the other thing is it's, you know, going public is not a liquidity event. Right. Right, it really isn't. I mean, you're locked up for a very long time. You don't know what you, the next quarter is going to hold. And if that's the case, then, yeah, you're probably better off as an entrepreneur to, to sell the business and, and, and mm -hmm. get it sold off. That's right. You can, well, if you go by the life stage theory that you were semi-referring to in your own decisions, I will say that if my teenagers are any example, there's <laughs> snap, Snap's got lots of continued potential. <laughs> Oh yeah, social I, media can I, can I, I'll platform you, I'll of choice. A funny yeah. story. So I have a one uh, a, a daughter in first grade, and just two days ago she tells my wife Mira, she says, "I'm so excited about going into fifth grade." Mm. And she's in first grade. My wife, my wife's like, "Why? Why are you excited about fifth grade?" She says, "Cause then I get a phone." <laughs> and, and my wife, my wife says, "Well, is that is that a rule?" Yes, and she right. says, "No, but you know, all all the fifth graders have phones." And so, you know, I, I get a phone in fifth grade. And my wife says, no, you'll get a phone when, you know, we're ready to, to get you a phone. And she says, like, well, that's not, that's not fair. She's like, and then she says, how am I going to snap with my friends? <laughs> right. She's, she's in first grade. And I'm like, and then, and then honestly, it's like I asked her, I have, do you know what snap is? Do you know what Snapchat? And she says, no, but the fifth graders talk about it. <laughs> Yes. Well, I'll put it this way. My 15-year-old yeah. has zero interest in yeah. having a Facebook account, but he's on Snapchat all the <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. So there you go. Um, so I want to bring, I, you know, just a few minutes, we'll open it up for some questions. But before we do that, I want to return to lawyers and lawyering. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'd love to hear a little bit, when, when you are hiring lawyers for your companies, what are you looking for? I mean, how do you think that lawyering for startups and entrepreneurship is or isn't different than um, lawyering on behalf of other kinds of ventures? I mean, of course, you, you always want just a good lawyer, right? right. But in, when it comes to uh, lawyers that are more entrepreneurial, what I look for in a lawyer is 
it, it's really a business advisor, mm -hmm. right? It's a business advisor first and understanding the lawyering, you know, second. Mm -hmm. Because I, I've worked with lawyers who just can't get out of their own way. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just, it's kind of sad to see, actually. They're like, they, it's like, go red line, the red line versus the red line. Red line. <laughs> 50 versions later, right. he comes back and says it can't be done. And it's like, no, it's like that's not the answer. Right. You, you know what I'm saying? It, it, it's, you got you to have lawyers who are entrepreneurial minded um, and, 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 and business first. I mean, that's what it comes down to. So it does come back in part to what you were saying earlier about some of the, the risk profile. You need, you need your lawyers to give you risk warnings, right? That's right. But you also need them to understand your risk preferences and have and be responsive to that that's 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 totally right because the the lawyers that i like working with and i i should say that i've been working with one lawyer for the past 20 years so um but he'll he'll tell me right he'll be like well brian here are the issues right i don't see the the likelihood of this but this could happen <laughs> If this happens, then blank, da 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 da. But right. if you're good with it, I'm good with it. Let's let, let's go. Right. Right. So at least I'm going in wide, eyes wide open. I know what the risks are. I'm willing to take those risks, mm -hmm. and let's move it forward. So I want to. I guess this will be my last question, and then we'll open it up to all of you. Um, but we are sitting here in a law school, and as I think about trying to teach our students um, about entrepreneurship, I'd really love to hear your thoughts about how we should be bringing that into our classroom, bringing our um, ideas about um, you know, training students vis-a-vis -vis risk and business advice and business judgment, and really helping train our students for the future. What do you think we ought to be doing along those lines? I mean, before you answer, I will say, we're doing a lot more than we were when you were a law student. Uh -huh. So, so uh, you should know that we, um, you know, we have Anderson School professors teaching courses here, including entrepreneurship courses. We have, um, we have a course on venture capital and startups. We have an experiential course that has students providing advice in a simulated setting. We let our students participate in a joint venture where they work with um, some biotech uh, firms and others on, on entrepreneurship issues. We also have the LMI Sandler Prize on entrepreneurship where law students competing with others um, from around UC CLA can win $100,000 in prizes toward their, their business ventures. Um, it's kind of a business plan prize, but for going concerns. So there's a lot of ways in which we are engaged with mm -hmm. um, entrepreneurial spirit and the entrepreneurial economy. But, but, but I also kind of think we're probably not doing enough. What would you, what would you advise? <laughs> well, first, I wish all that existed when I was in law school. Um, it sounds really exciting. Yeah, uh, I'm, you know, I think it's wonderful what the Lowell Milken Institute's doing and the Sandler Prize, and, and I, I honestly wish that existed when I was here. Um, you know, I, I think the school, I think, does a great job, right, with absolutely like teaching the lawyering skills and, and the analytical skills and the deductive reasoning skills that, that I apply to, to my, my work all the time. And you still use them, right? Absolutely, Good. of course. I'd like to hear that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, hope it's even true, but I like is, to hear it. True, true. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, I, I think, I think, you know, encouraging students to get out more. Mm -hmm. I think that's another thing too. It, it's, you know, when I when I when I was in law school, I was kind of stressed out sometimes about work, about about the the actual studying part. And I wish, looking back now, I'm like, it's so silly to be so stressed out. You know about about a nobody's grade asking or, any more what you got as your grade in business associations, right? Yeah, or like it, no, no one's asking, right? It's like oh, you, all they say is you graduated. Yes, I graduated, um, barely. <laughs> Not true. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's I, I would say encourage them to get out into the community more, meet entrepreneurs. Into it's like you don't have to intern at Scadden. You don't have to use your summer internship at O'Melveny to get great experience, you know, if, if the entrepreneurial path is what you want to take. So even when it comes to, you know, the, the interview processes for the summer, I remember going through that process, I would bring in companies, you know, I would bring in startups to, 
to Snap, to, mm -hmm. to Facebook, who has a big campus here. I, I, I would try to invite them in and, and try to encourage students, if you're interested in this path, why don't you work there over the summer? Mm -hmm. right? I, I would encourage them to join a lot of the networks. There, there's, there's literally two or three tech events every night in Los Angeles, which makes it a great city. Right. I would encourage the law school to reach out to some of these groups and say, can some of our students come? Can they attend? They, they're interested in learning more. Mm -hmm. That's good thought. Right? So, so that's part of it. Mm -hmm. But it's also, I think the curriculum has come a long way since I've, I've been in school. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to, to spend more time with you to, mm -hmm. to understand mm -hmm. you know, that curriculum and see what we can't add to that and, mm -hmm. and, and bolster it. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think we I think we do some of those things, but I think there is more to be done. I mean, a lot of our students do extern in a variety of places, mm -hmm. and um, we've broadened our networks, especially for the first year summer experience. Mm -hmm. Second year, many of the students are still looking for that traditional mm -hmm. firm option, in part because they want an option on it afterwards and think it might be where they mm -hmm. they want to start, just as you did right um and this goes back to that mindset place we began where um where that's that might be harder to disrupt but this gives us a lot to think about and yeah. and it's exciting um and I'm, I'm proud of the steps we have taken but i do think there's 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 there is room for growth let's open it up to what's on some of your minds um if you don't have questions i've got more but i suspect in this room we've got more than a few so who would like to start us off yes But I actually took a liking to it once I get it, got into it, and 40 years later, I'm still doing it. But I, I want you to talk about how being taught to think like a lawyer has made you a better entrepreneur. So it's a great question because because I don't I don't really think about that. I just think like a lawyer sometimes because it's just you know what you learn, um, and so I, I I do analyze a lot. I do pay attention to the, the details of a contract. Um, and I do, I, I was a tax lawyer, so I'm always interested in you know, the tax implications of whatever we do. Um, so I, a lot of those skills are just kind of ingrained in me. Um, but in terms of, I'm sorry, your, the second part of your question was? Well, just how, how did those skills influence your role or your success as an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think it, it, it's, it's been incredibly helpful um, in, I guess, what you would call my success in, in business. Um, it, it, it has hindered me a couple times in terms of perception, and you kind of brought this up earlier, is when, I, when we started LegalZoom, when Brian and I started LegalZoom, we went out to a bunch of venture capitalists, and, and we, we hit up probably 45 VC firms, of which 45 turned us down. Right? Like literally not a single VC firm out there would give us a dime. And probably about a quarter of the time, they would say, you're lawyers. And this is you know, 20 years ago. They'd say, you're lawyers. Like, what do you know about business? What do you know about managing people? What do you know about actually you know, building here? And, and, and both of us were, it was kind of funny, we're like, we're not really lawyers. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so I forgive so you. That, that, I don't think I don't think that would be the case today because there's you know the world has changed since 20 years ago. But um, yeah, I think it's been incredibly helpful for me. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I, I, I can I see it. There, there, 
I say the world has changed, but it's changed a lot, but it hasn't changed completely. Um, and there is a bias, right? It's like if, I, if, I, if I'm hiring for a certain position, you know, and the person's been a lawyer for the last 10 years, just automatically I'm like, oh, they're just going to over-lawyer all of this, mm. right? And so there is that bias, um, even in myself. And so it, it, it's hard because you, you, the legal skills that you've gained are, is absolutely helpful in business, but you know, it, it's not the legal skills that are going to make you successful in business, right? And I would really play upon that and, 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 and hone in on those skills um, and use the legal skills as more of a, of a backstop, right? Um, but, you know move more towards the business aspect if that's the goal that you want to want to gain. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's basically there aren't a lot of e-commerce companies that are profitable. I'll just start there, right? Amazon today without AWS would not be profitable on their core business. Um, so when you look at you know e-commerce and not being profitable, the biggest acquisitions in the space are companies that were unprofitable. Okay, so Jet.com. Uh, uh, Dollar Shave Club, um, Ring was not profitable. Maybe Ring was. I don't even know. I shouldn't say that. Um, Zulily, you know, there, there's so many e-commerce acquisitions that were made that were of unprofitable businesses. But it's all based on, you know, how much scale can you get to, you know, and really kind of show the investor like, this is where we want to be. Yes, it's going to be a hard road to get there. We're going to have to raise a lot of capital to get there, but it's really more about scale and demand um, without unit economics that make zero sense. You got to at some point turn to profitability, right, at some point. And it all depends on how much you want to scale and how much capital can you raise. So Bezos, the beauty of, of Amazon and, and, and Jeffrey Bezos is he's convinced everyone forever that he doesn't have to be profitable, right? Like, like, no, seriously, right? It's like, he's just like, but look at the scale. And we can be profitable, we can be profitable, but he never had to do it, right? He, he might have had a couple quarters here or there where he was profitable, but, but he's convinced a whole, so, and, 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 and he proved himself right, right? Look what he's built. It's, it's nothing short of a phenomenon. I mean, who's not shopping on Amazon, right? It's Amazon. And then everybody else. It, 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 it's really the only game in town. And he won, right? And so, so when you look at e-commerce, it, it's, you know, you got it. You, I, I think the whole world is changing, too, to get to that point. It, it's, I think in the next, you know, five years, you're going to see a, a, a real revolution happen in e-commerce with autonomous vehicles and drones. Um, the The... The hardest part of any e-commerce business is the pick, pack, ship, and logistics, right? That's what eats up all the margin. And when you're looking at, you know, robotics and where those are heading, like Invia is a company in town, a robotics company that's making the pick, you know, 25% cheaper than a human pick, right? And, and that's just going to get better and better. And then you talk about the shipping logistics. Today we got UPS and FedEx and soon you're going to have an explosion of autonomous vehicle delivery companies that are going to compete hard, right? Bringing your cost as, as an e-commerce company way down, right? So there, there's a lot in the works that, that'll open it up for e-commerce even further. Of course, the biggest benefactor of all this is going to be Amazon, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to parlay down into, you know, smaller businesses. Great. I think we have time for one last question. I saw a hand over here. Where are you? Yeah. yeah so
Yeah. It, it was really naivety, I guess. <laughs> Part of how big part of it was. Um, I remember the very first day that Brian and I pitched a VC firm was the day the NASDAQ crashed. So it was that day. And we <laughs> knocked on the door, and this was his uncle at a, at a place called Dynafund that invested into um, uh, e-toys and a few others. And we knocked on the door, and he opened the door, and he says, what are you doing here? And we're like, we're here to pitch you our dot-com idea. And he's like, do you know what's happening? And we're like, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a little blip. Right? <laughs> and he sat us down, and he said, it's over. <laughs> and we said, what, what, what do you mean? He says, the internet is never coming back. <laughs> this is a true, true story. And we're like, oh, shoot. Like, what are we going to do? Because we both quit our jobs already. <laughs> we quit our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and, then he, and then he says, he says, you should go back to Skadden and, and ask him for your job back. <laughs> so, so the both of us, we, we were so disheartened, but we went across the street. We went to Benihana. There's a Benihana across from him. And we're sitting there in front of the tampon guy making a mistake. And we're both looking at each other like, what, what should we do, right? And then, honestly, it was, it, was, it was that moment. And we both looked at each other and we said, how much do you really believe in this, right? And both of us were like, 100%. 100% people would rather pay $99 for a last will and testament, flat fee, than 2,000 bucks, right? We, we believed it 100%. And so we're like, I don't care if we don't raise money. We're just gonna go do this. And LegalZoom started on a $50,000 loan from my parents. Right, that's how we got Legal Zoom started. We started in my condo, and we just kept growing it, and we just kept growing it. But it was, it was, it was, it was. I don't know, looking back on it now, it's like, yeah, it sounds kind of scary, right? But at the time, we weren't scared. We, we just, this was it. This is, this is going to work. That's the perfect note on which to end. Uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you.